Thank you, Catherine. Thanks for having me and um, welcome everybody. I'm really, really happy about these hepatitis B echo programs because they're just doing a fantastic job of clarifying the hepatitis B world. There's a lot of, I would say, some old information, some misinformation, and the clarity and granularity uh, is just absolutely wonderful. Uh, these are all my different affiliations. And what's not on here is I work as the medical director of the Asia Pacific Health Foundation with Ben Tran and Kayla Yang in San Diego and a whole team of people here. But I didn't want to take up everything on the slide with all my projects. So I'm just happy to be part of this and honored to be here. Uh, next slide, please. So one thing I want to comment on this slide is that you will be seeing different numbers about hepatitis B prevalence. And the number 292 is really what should stick in your mind uh, because that came out of this WHO Polaris Collaborative. It's the most robust way of looking at hepatitis B prevalence. You'll see other numbers of 240 million, 250 million, which I consider underestimates. And it's good to use the higher number because that's what we think the real number is. And the, the bigger the number, the more attention we get and uh, the more funding we get. Uh, also on this slide, I wanna highlight the 2.4 million in the US. That's the paper that we published uh, with Robert Wong. I was a senior author. I think that's actually in print now. Uh, so 2.4 is what we use now for the US. You'll see numbers from the CDC as low in the seven or 800,000, one third this number. Uh, you, you have to remember the CDC as wonderful as they are, leadership um, tools, they're severely underfunded. And when you're underfunded, you have challenges uh, estimating prevalence data. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, I see 296 with WHO. Nice. Catherine, do you have a reference you can email to everybody on that? I will. I'll find the link um, after today's session and, and share it with everyone in the notes. Great. So in this slide, I think everybody is aware of these different phases, of course, of chronic hepatitis B. <laughs> Patients are most worried about cancer, probably second about stigma, third about cirrhosis, decompensation. Of course, there should be transplant, liver transplant on this slide is another box. But I wanna highlight in the lower left corner and <clears throat> the upper right corner, something called OBI. That's occult hepatitis B. So we just gave you these numbers in the 290 range for hepatitis B, but they're in the, uh, sorry, in the, in the world population, 30 to 40% of the population is hepatitis B core antibody positive. And about 10% of those people have um, hepatitis B DNA circulating in their blood. So when we define hepatitis B, I just want to be really clear. We're defining hepatitis B as either being surface antigen positive or hepatitis B DNA positive. And this is a CDC definition. This should be the definition in all the health departments around the United States, because we will find patients who are hepatitis B DNA positive who are surface antigen negative. And that might increase the global prevalence of hepatitis B by 20 to 30 million people. We might be up closer to 350 million people if you include occult hepatitis B in your numbers. So, Keep all this in mind. Finally, there's 2 billion people who are core antibody positive. We know core antibody is a very accurate test. Uh, false positive rate is maybe two per thousand. So when you see somebody who's core antibody positive, you know that person has this CCC DNA, this, uh, a, a, uh, we call it a, a form of hepatitis B in the cell, in the nucleus that sits there uh, lifelong, rarely clear. Next slide, please. So there's a lot of gaps in awareness, eligible for treatment, entering into care. My point on this slide is, is that there's a fairly big movement taking place clinically and from an advocacy perspective that the guidelines are barriers to accessing care, and meaning we're gonna be treating people, I think within five years, maybe even sooner. Anybody who's DNA positive, that secondary test after you do surface antigen, will be eligible, will be discussed, will be recommended for treatment. 
So we don't have these guidelines about ALT levels and DNA levels and fibrosis levels and biopsy levels. Uh, we may begin to really treat this earlier and earlier as a liver disease, as an infectious disease, as a systemic disease, and try to suppress virus. Also, of course, the next phase is getting rid of surface antigen. Next slide, please. I want to make sure everybody's aware of the difference between liver enzymes and liver function. AST, ALT are not liver function tests. You should not be using that term in your um, practice, talking to patients or providers. These are liver enzymes. This is a big shift. There's a lot of people who don't want to change this terminology. They love the word liver function test, but the patients don't love the word liver function test because if you say liver function to a patient, and you tell them they're abnormal or elevated or wrong, then they start believing they're in liver failure. Why aren't they getting a liver transplant? How long do they have to live? So really liver enzymes is a reassuring way to talk to your patients about liver inflammation. Next slide. All right, so what do you do for these hepatitis B patients? Surface antigen, core antibody, surface antibody please make sure you're using the right terms with your patients. The core antibody is exposure, but that exposure means they still have residual virus in their liver, even if surface antigen is negative, even if DNA is negative. One thing that's very important is there is no natural immunity to hepatitis B. You will find that term in hundreds of peer-reviewed publications. Unfortunately, this is a term that's fake news. There is no natural immunity. What we now use is the word immune control. If you see core antibody together with surface antibody, surface antigens negative, DNA's negative, immune control is the best term. So I'm moving pretty fast through these slides because we have a relatively short time, but as you know, these slides are shareable, downloadable. Please share, please use these to really format how you think about hepatitis B and how <clears throat> how you discuss hepatitis B. Next slide, please. Lots of information on this slide. Uh, it will get simpler, but I still use a lot of these um, tests to help decide how to take care of a patient. Uh, just as an example, I'm going to look at every hepatitis B patient, look for fatty liver. I do a test called quantitative surface antigen that's available through Quest and LabCorp. It tells you where that patient is in terms of immune control or immune clearance, the chance of getting a functional cure. We at the Hepatitis B Foundation recommend all hepatitis B surface antigen patients get Delta testing. You score them for risk for liver cancer. So a lot of information on this slide. I could spend 15 minutes just talking about this slide, but I want you to keep in mind there's a good amount of workup that's needed for the total care of the patient. Next slide, please. And finally, take a good alcohol history, take a good family history, uh, make sure you establish their bone health, their renal health. Of course, we rarely do liver biopsies. If you're in a perinatal clinic, you're managing pregnancy, there's some very specific discussions there. Next slide, please. Every patient wants to know um, the status of their liver, the health of their liver, how much scar tissue they have. You want to know this has to do with overall prognosis. When do you start testing or doing surveillance for liver cancer? Uh, do, are they heading towards a transplant? How aggressive do you have to be about counseling them about compliance? So F score, very important. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Patient education and counseling. Treatment is not just giving somebody a tablet or an injection. Treatment includes education. Uh, I just tell people not to drink alcohol. <clears throat> I, I don't know if these words avoid or limit sometimes are uh, underemphasized by the patient. That means I can drink. And then when people drink, it's not really clear how much. So you tell them to not drink alcohol. Uh, they may you know, imbibe a few times a year. If you give them looser criteria, they may be drinking a lot more. And of course, you're gonna be managing fatty liver as part of their treatment. Next slide, please. So a little bit more about education. Um, you really want to have that patient fully compliant. Hepatitis B Foundation has done some very interesting monitoring and surveys 
And my interpretation, what I've heard from Catherine and Kate and other people is that the um, patients, about 40% drop off treatment in, in less than five years. And they stop on their own, uh, don't tell their providers or come back to their providers later. So the better you educate the patient, the more compliant they're gonna be with the whole treatment package. Next slide, please. So if you have a patient who has elevated HPV DNA, has elevated ALT, a suggestion of fibrosis, you can put this little question up here. Kathleen, we don't have a, a polling way though, right? This is just a, a, a discussion point? Correct. Okay, so <clears throat> pegylated interferon is approved, it's in the guidelines, but very rarely used. It may come back to be used more in the future um, as we come out with newer therapies to reactivate the immune system. If you have any patients on a Adepavir or Lamivudine, you need to make sure they get off those medicines immediately and are put on a first-line therapy. It has to do with side effects, resistance, failures. You know, if they look stable on one of these two drugs, they're not stable. They're not going to clear hepatitis B. They're likely to get resistance and break through or with a defavir, have bone or kidney issues. So we have tenofovir, the TDF is provoxyl. We have tenofovir, alafenamide, TAF, and then tecavir. Should be one of those three medicines. We'll talk about that in a moment. Next slide, please. DNA is a huge amount of the story. The higher the DNA, the higher the risk of liver cancer, the higher the DNA, the higher the risk of cirrhosis. We want all of our patients to be DNA negative, not under 100, not under 50, not under 1,000. We want DNA undetectable. This changes outcomes by suppressing. Next slide, please. Uh, this goes to guidelines. This is pretty complicated. If the hepatitis B DNA is elevated, if the ALT is in a certain range, if their liver cancer biomarkers, uh, what is their age? Do they have other risk factors? If they're a family history, there's a lot going on here. Really, we're moving to DNA detectable treat. So that's treating earlier. You don't have all of these things to think about. If one is true and three aren't, what do you do? The patient goes into an indeterminate zone, you're not sure, they're not sure. Uh, so we are gonna really work hard on simplifying this, uh, these guidelines in the near future. Next slide, please. There's a little bit more on AASLD criteria. I'm not gonna expand on this slide anymore other than saying it's just too complicated. Next slide, please. So this is a little nice table. Um, what I like to use is this, if you want to look at the guidelines, very simple, DNA over 2000, ALT elevated, <clears throat> strong likelihood to treat. DNA over 2000, ALT elevated, any fibrosis by these non-invasive testing, by fibro scan, by Velocure, uh, blood tests like liver fast or some of the other uh, blood tests of them, any sign of fibrosis, much more likely to treat. This is more simple than some of these other big diagrams and tables that we've shown you, but this is a really good guidance. Next slide. So <clears throat> we have TDF, TAF. Those two drugs are preferred, specifically TAF, if the patient has renal disease and especially if they have bone disease. Uh, pegylated interferon because of so many side effects uh, and rare viral control, viral control meaning S antigen loss, DNA negative, rare viral control, even if you use the endpoint of just DNA negativity. There is no role for combining TDF, TAF with Entecavir, except in very special situations of treatment failure and maybe treatment resistance. Next slide, please. Entecavir. <clears throat> viral control at year five was 94% with DNA undetectable. This is a little less sensitive a test. It went down to 60 IUs per ml and 80% with normalization of their liver enzymes. The people who didn't normalize, sometimes it was fatty liver, sometimes it was alcohol, sometimes residual hepatitis B. In my practice, when I use Entecavir, I just use the one milligram dose. Next slide. <clears throat> This is TDF data out to eight years. 
There's some bad news on this slide is because we don't lose E antigen in you know, all these patients. It's about 50%, a similar number you see with Impecavir. But you know there's E antigen positive and E antigen negative disease. E antigen positive is the wild type virus. It has less or no mutations, a little easier to control earlier. Control meaning get, getting rid of E antigen and suppressing DNA. <clears throat> But also here you can see surface antigen loss is only in the E-positive patients and only about 10%. <clears throat> Why this is important is because every patient wants to lose surface antigen. And that's why we need new therapies. Next slide, please. TAF is a prodrug. We're delivering the same amount or higher amounts of tenofovir into the liver cell by giving about a sixth of the dose. This has gone from 300 milligrams down to 25 milligrams. It's a pro-drug, it's focused on liver delivery, much less systemic exposure, much less renal and bone disease risk. Next slide, please. Kaplan, we're almost done. <clears throat> so this is a really nice paper by Dr. Jang and Dr. Locke, really liberalizing and stepping outside the treatment guidelines. So it's a really nice paper to review. Next slide, please. Entecavir, why would I use Entecavir over TAF? Those are my two favorites, my two first line medicines. I work in a federal clinic in San Diego and Entecavir is extremely inexpensive. Uh, it's, uh, it's one fifth or one sixth the cost of TDF or TAF. So if you are in a federal clinic, an FQHC or rural clinic, there are special government programs, government access to Entecavir as a generic that's very, very inexpensive. Entecavir has no bone risk. Entecavir has no renal risk. This is important too to be thinking about. So you've got somebody with renal disease or bone disease, you're gonna use either Entecavir or TAF over TDF. Next slide, please. Monitoring. Every patient with hepatitis B on or off treatment should be in clinic every six months for laboratory testing. That's liver enzymes, liver function, checking their hepatitis B DNA status, if they're E antigen positive, you'll be monitoring their E antigen status also. And of course, you're going to monitor renal. And every two to three years, you'll be monitoring bone health and bone status. And then liver cancer surveillance is also important. Screening is the first test. Surveillance is ongoing testing. I highly recommend you use the word surveillance when you talk about liver cancer monitoring. And also highly recommend that you do the triple liver cancer biomarker panel that is FDA cleared. All the test components are FDA cleared. And you can use that to calculate what's called a GALAD score. This is a really way to look out five years what the patient's risk of liver cancer is. Next slide, please. The, there are these black box warnings, like uh, I talked about um, two things. One is flares of hepatitis B. People stop their uh, medicine. Either you tell them to stop it or they stop it on their own. Uh, there's also warnings about lactic acidosis, which I've never seen, and I've treated thousands of hepatitis B patients. This is a little bit of a holdover from the HIV days. Next slide. Engage your patients. Schedule follow-up include education, include lifestyle, health, uh, weight management, alcohol management. Tell them there's no cure for hepatitis B, even with surface antigen loss, we call that a functional cure. It's not a real cure, it's not a complete cure, it's not a sterilizing cure, but it changes outcomes. It's a chronic disease, it's controllable, it's suppressible. Next slide, please. You can improve adherence by all of these different discussions and working with a team and repeating these messages. Next slide, please. And we rarely stop nukes. There are some guidelines about stopping, but if, we're, if the stopping takes place, the patient needs to be in a monitored setting. I basically treat all my patients till S antigen loss. If I have a cirrhotic patient and they lose S antigen, I'm really thinking about stopping therapy one to two years after they lose S antigen, especially if their cirrhosis is reversing or definitely stable and liver function stable. Next slide, please. All right, we already covered all this. We wanna get rid of E antigen if they're E antigen positive. We wanna get rid of surface antigen in all of our patients eventually. 
We want all HPV DNA to be undetectable. Next slide. <clears throat> Use your specialists. <clears throat> there's a lot of, <clears throat> sorry, there's a lot of uh, reasons to use liver specialists at your practice. Here's a list of some options. I think we're almost at the last slide. Don't let your patients slip through the cracks. Next slide, please. Six pillars to wrap things up. Check all patients for triple panel. This will hopefully come out from the CDC in November uh, as they pair up with ACIP's recommendation to vaccinate all adults. A uh, core antibody can indicate occult hepatitis B. Really think about that. We've discussed that here on ECHO. Um, you're gonna vaccinate patients who are triple negative. We have a really good vaccine, two-dose vaccine called Heplosav B. Uh, very high response, even in more difficult to vaccinate patients, patients being at lower response rates historically. ALTs, they're healthy as 25 in women, 35 in men. Uh, next slide. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Gish. Um, I wanted to now open it up to the group for any questions that they might have. Um, feel free to put them either in the chat box or raise your hand if you have any questions. Dr. Gish, thank you for a great presentation. Um, I just wanted to ask about HIV screening. Do, how often do you screen your patients that are on one either uh, tenofovir for HIV? So HIV screening, and then I guess if it's a repeat, it would be surveillance would be just in high or very high risk individuals. We all do take good risk histories. Uh, we trust our history, we trust our patients in general. So it would be rare. I'm in my patient population at the federal clinic in San Diego. It's basically one time testing unless they're a sex worker or an active IV drug user. And then, of course, we do monitoring for B, C, and HIV. Does that make sense? It makes sense. Yeah. And on my population, I would be concerned about uh, monitoring a little bit closer people that are actively injecting or, as you mentioned, other risk factors. Uh, my other question is around um, some negative uh, effects of TAP, of tenofovir, um, elevated lipids and or weight gain. Have you looked at any of that data or have any concerns about people that you might start on tenofovir when they're 30s and they might be on it for several decades? Yes, it's a great question. <clears throat> TDF actually resulted in a more favorable lipid profile, right? A little lower cholesterol, lower LDL. Um, in TAF, there's a shift towards a different uh, profile of lipids, LDL and HDL. Um, one thing is the LDL to HDL rest ratios, I understand, stayed the same, even, you, even though they saw shifts in absolute numbers. So that's favorable from a cardiac perspective. I use statins in most of my patients for a variety of reasons. Sometimes it's hyperlipidemia. I definitely use statins aggressively and diabetics trying to get the LDL down in the 50 to 60 range. I use statins to protect the liver. They're anti-inflammatory, they're anti-fibrotic. So in that setting, any of these lipid changes that you might see with TAF, I think are um, inconsequential. Uh, and finally, the weight gain is, tends to be at just a few pounds. I have no idea why that's occurring. I don't know why this medicine would have people gain weight. There's no um, uh, real physical reason or pharmacologic reason for that. And as you know, TAF has much better um, ALT response uh, than TDF. We don't understand that either, but we think it may be because of better intrahepatocyte virus reduction. So a lot going on, the lipid and weight issues have been raised as minor concerns. I think we can handle those easily um, in our practice. And I, th I think it's a superior medicine. Thank you. We do have a question that came through in the chat box. 
Um, the question is, is there any benefit in vaccinating a patient who is hep B core antibody positive with negative surface antibody? Right, so we have stopped vaccinating core positive patients. You will see in various review papers, even in AASLD guidelines about vaccinating these individuals, boosting them, seeing if you can get an antibody response. And it's an incredible waste of time and money. There's never been any paper published in the world that this has clinical benefit. You can have a cosmetic change in surface antibody, but nothing that changes outcomes. And sometimes the patients think they're protected. It doesn't decrease reactivation risk. Um, and it's still in the ACTG guidelines for HIV patients to get these booster vaccines with no data. Uh, Mark Silkowski, who is one of the most you know, brilliant IV doctors that I know, knows about the hepatitis and HIV world. And he still talks about giving boosters. And I say, show me the data. And I've never seen any data to support boosting um, this. So, uh, you know, boosting vaccination in general is almost gone. And boosting core positive patients should be gone. Um, and then there's a request for clarifying the definition of um, occult infection again, if you don't mind, Dr. Gish. Um, and then um, uh, many of the colleagues surveillance for hepatitis B order sets a limit, uh, the hepatitis B screening to just the surface antigen and not the core. Should I advise to look for occult cases? Right. So occult hepatitis B, there's, there's a couple different definitions, but let's use the most common one. And that is surface antigen negative, DNA positive. That's occult hepatitis B from a clinical perspective. Now, any patient who's getting tested for hepatitis B in the developed world, we'll talk about low and middle income countries in a moment. In the developed world where we live, everybody should get the triple panel, no questions asked. There are places who are resources constrained in this world, of course, and in those places where testing costs are a significant uh, impact. And if you can test three times the number of people for surface antigen by not doing the triple panel, just doing a single test, maybe with a rapid test, that is preferred, but not in North America, Western Europe, the Asia Pacific Rim, triple panel is really what's advised. Thank you. Um, any other questions, comments, um, or follow-ups from the chat box? So oh, Dr. Gish, when you mentioned CCC DNA, you were not speaking of cult. You were speaking of just the fact that people that have core antibody have CC DNA, but that's not the 10% of people living with a cult. Right, so Kevin just brought up a good point. The, the true deep definition of a cult hepatitis B is anybody with CCC DNA. Because they have B in their liver, their surface antigen is negative, their core antibody most of the time is positive, but that's not a good clinical definition to use in your practice. What you're really worried about is somebody surface antigen negative, core positive who has DNA in their blood, because those people need to be managed basically as if they're surface antigen positive. They've got DNA circulating that you can measure. It's over six international units, which is the typical threshold for the Abbott and the, the Roche tests. They need to be managed like every, anybody else. Liver cancer surveillance, observation for progression, consider nuke therapy. Thank you. Any follow-up questions on that? Um, it looks like Jared has a question. Um, as part of prior auth for hep C DAAs, insurance companies typically want you to provide hepatitis B immunization, even if they just have isolated um, anti-HBC AB. Uh, do you just tell the insurance companies that you won't be immunizing them? That's exactly what you should do. Hold your ground. Don't let the insurance companies push you around. Sometimes they're five to 10 years behind. Just like some insurance companies ask for hepatitis C genotype, 
and we I tell my staff to fill out the form and put in genotype Y. Have you heard about genotype Y? It's, it's the new genotype for hepatitis C. It's Y test for genotype. We usually get it through with a smile. Great, great questions, guys. Um, keep them coming in. I think um, we'll continue on just in the interest of time onto our case presentation. But if anything else comes up along those lines, just put them in the chat box and we'll be sure to get to them today for you. Um, we'll also include some information on the occult definition as well as a follow-up and I'll uh, ref uh, reference Dr. Gish as well um, for some of that, just so you guys can have 